It's the Allison Armstrong Show, and I'm Allison Armstrong. Although some of you may remember me as the evil Nellie Olson, tonight I am Allison Armstrong, and it is the Allison Armstrong Show. And here on the Allison Armstrong Show, we talk about things that make you feel good. The movies and the TV shows that made us feel good and the people who made them. And people who are doing things now to make the world a better and more interesting place. And we have one of those tonight. Okay, I'm... I'm so excited. You know, you know, I often get my friends on here. I get people I actually knew and like work with and stuff. And so it's like, ah, somebody like this. Yay, I'm all my friends. Um, and I've been talking about this all day. Guess who's coming on the show? It's a prairie reunion. Yes. I made his him steal the answers from his mother's desk so we could cheat on the final exam. Andy Garvey. <laughs> yes, it's Patrick Laberto, the the lovely Andy Garvey from our show, as well as about five thousand other things. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick. <laughs> Hey, hey, Allison, how are you? I am fabulous. I'm, I am. I'm excited. I'm so excited that you're on my show. I just, you're oh just a wonderful God, person. Oh, my God, it's so exciting you have it. a show. This is, it's great. It's <laughs> right? awesome. This is awesome. So, yeah. You know, basically, let's yeah. let's be honest, though. Yes. You've had a show since I've known you. They just never had cameras on it. I was always doing a show. It's just <laughs> nobody always, in the darn You were thing. always hosting a show. <laughs> It was like, hello, good evening. Hi, hi. Are you on a show? No, there's nobody here. Hi. Um, it's, it's yes. And now finally I have a, a venue to 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 do this madness in. Um, this is so much fun. I just adore you and always have, and you're awesome. And you've done Thank so many you. awesome things. Um, obviously, a lot of my fans and people tune in are going, How is Andy Garvey? Um, because we love you on Little House. Um, but also you're very, very famous, particularly for Jag. Bob and I, the husband, big Jag fans, big Jag oh, cool. fans, watched it like mad. And we're like, oh, look, oh, yeah, okay, it's Matt. So we were like <laughs> totally jazzed. We're on it. Um, I cannot count the number of people, including adult, seemingly rational, educated people who have said, how did he lose his leg? <laughs> who were not quite clear on the whole reality, not reality TV thing. And seriously asked me if your leg had been amputated because of the Jag thing. Yeah, they'll they'll go to Spider Man and and they're okay with understanding that there's you know not spider people. But I right. look, I, I get the same question, and and of course you take it as a as a compliment to the way that. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Watch this. Hey Siri, turn off the music. <laughs> Sorry, I can't do that. In the oh, she can't do that. Hold on. <laughs> Okay, that was hilarious. Um, Suri has refused to direct command, and he has to go fix the thing. I've never you Def Leppard fans, Suri hopefully this no. won't be pulled down for, for Def Leppard uh, infringement. <laughs> um, yeah, it, you know, you take it as a compliment, because basically the way that they did it, they spent a lot of time making sure that it looked realistic. Um, in fact, I put up a picture on Twitter of uh, when I got my leg blown off, and I woke up this morning at 4.30 to the email saying that my Twitter account has been like closed because I've put up disturbing <laughs> battlefield images that's oh, not allowed by Twitter. It was like you were and I had to, yeah, they, I, I had to say, no, it's a makeup effect. And, you know, like I had to, I had to argue with them and, you know, like make a, make a whole claim and everything. And then they finally said, okay, that's fine. That's fine. But yeah, Twitter. the. Twitter thought it was freaking real. And you have, with the picture, his whole explanation, how they dug a hole and you yeah. stuck your leg in a hole and then they painted you up with the fake blood. So it looked like, oh no, his leg is gone. Exactly. And you're telling me that somebody at Twitter who checks in, oh, this is a terrible, gory photo of this poor man on a battlefield. Had, had said, to be a robot. I mean, that first flagged it. Cause once you look at it and you read the tweet, you kind of get the whole idea. But you know, it, the whole effect was done not only just that effect, but the other effects on the show were all kind of low fidelity. The The biggest one, which they did, was imagine me standing up straight and then just bending my leg back at the knee. Ow. And then they shot it. They they just shot it from the front angle and it looked like I had half a leg. And they so and I just doing, hid my leg behind the, my back. Were you doing like the cheesy old Long John Silver stuff where we just bend our knee up and like take the thing on and go, R kind of? Absolutely. In fact, in fact, I'll probably put it on Twitter tomorrow. I've got pictures of me going to the prosthetics doctor's office where they took a cast of my knee so that they could build a fake prosthetic that would fit on my knee when my knee was bent. And so then we did, that was basically how we did it. And then, of course, we had other guys that were real amputees that would, you know, like, you know, double for me in certain scenes. Right. 
And, you know, but it was, it was pretty amazing considering how, how many people really believe it. And I think if I'm, you know, and again, I'm like you, I watch TV. I love TV. I watch, I'm a big fan of TV and, and movies. When you're connected to a character, I think mm-hmm. they're connected to the story part of it, not the, you know, the special effects. They just don't want Bud to lose a leg. Everyone liked Bud. Yeah, and, and I think it's because you know, I think the show, because the show had enough emotional content and characters, people connected to it. This is, we kept going back, going, let's watch Jack again, and found ourselves getting sucked in and watching this and getting involved in the characters. It's a good right. show. So I think people got so into it, and then, yes, her character was so likable. It's like, oh, but that even if by today's standards it was like cheesy special effects, people just like, if, if you hadn't been a good actor or the character wasn't so beloved, they probably would have gone, oh, look at the guy bending his knee in a wheelchair. What they do? <laughs> but, <laughs> but because they'd already gotten sucked in, it was like, oh my God, he lost. But I mean, Bob and I would watch it and we'd see you in the wheelchair with like what was obviously like, like your leg tucked up. And we'd go, you know, that looks really good. I mean, we know he stuck his leg up, but I'll be damned if it doesn't look like he had his leg amputated. And so we watched that. Yeah. It looked pretty damn good. Yeah, but they did a good job and to the point where a CBS had to issue a statement saying that I had not lost my leg. Okay, so and really was it's not just my cuckoo friends because no, no, it was like, it was a big thing. There was a big thing in TV Guide. There's a big thing when online first started where they would ask these online uh, websites, and so CBS finally had to announce that no, Patrick Laberto has both legs, and it was all makeup and stuff. People get I have people coming. Oh my god, the guy who was on the show, he lost his leg. I'm like. But he t- oh my god no it was amazing it was amazing right. and i think i you know, talked to someone the other day i said you were on the show and i said oh yeah you know he's that thing on jag where he lost his leg and like, oh how did that happen i was like on the show on the show i said on the show it was- <laughs> and it's, I gotta tell you, it's not it, like it was hot cgi state of the art no it was- no i mean i think we did one green screen or one green sock where i put a sock on it at one point and then they were able to take it out but my my wife and i were watching a movie one time 10 years ago and i saw an actor and they had you know they had lost they had a prosthetic they had a prosthetic arm they had lost their arm and i turned around i go i had no idea they had lost their arm she goes are you kidding me <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a movie like dude you're an idiot you of all people i mean <laughs> you're an idiot <laughs> you're the guy who sat on his leg for like a yeah couple of years. exactly like, you know, know, e- when someone is doing even hawk has his arm <laughs> <laughs> See, but there you go. If the actor is good and they've kind of right. like sucked you in, you start, oh, yeah, it's really happening. Um, now, of course, obviously, my friends who are watching are like, oh, it's Andy Garvey. Um, we do love you on the show. We always do this, like, everyone, especially people, everybody has a great audition story and how they got the job. But Little House, for some reason, everyone who's on the show have, like, the best freaking audition stories. I mean, Charlotte, our Charlotte Stewart, is Miss Beetle. Uh-huh. She took. She came in to read for Miss Beetle and said, "Can I use the desk?" And made you know Ben <laughs> Friendly and Michael get up and move and took their desk. It was like, "Be quiet, your class!" And of course, they were like blown away. So everybody has like these bananas on their. You had the weird thing that a lot, well, practically everyone in the show had, where you were related to someone on the show, which was right. cool because okay, Michael had both his kids. He had um, Leslie Landon and Mike Jr. were on. Uh, mm-hmm. Melissa Gilbert, of course, her brother Jonathan Gilbert was playing my brother Willie, and it went like on and on. Then we had eight thousand sets of twins, um, the baby right. twins, baby Rose twins, baby and then Harry most twins. of the extras were daughters and sons of the crew. Yeah, it was all the crew's kids. We're sitting in the schoolroom, yeah. and everyone's really. And then you and your brother Matt are both. So you have Albert and 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 they're actually it's completely. So um, everybody was related to everybody, and also practically everyone on the show was adopted, or they were in a blended right. family where people got divorced and remarried, and had eight thousand step brothers and sisters. And I was like the only person who went. Mm, my parents. And, yeah, yeah, my birth parents. And, oh, yeah, they live with me. <laughs> the only and you're one also the only one that your parents never came to the set. Like never. They, once in a blue moon, my mother would go. I suppose I should come down and like visit. And then my father, right. was my manager, and I should I should come down there and make sure everything's being done. But mostly, yeah, my Annie Marion came. My parents yeah. were like, great, great go go. She was so awesome. So how did you get the job? Was it because like Matt was on first, right? Because he was out. Yeah, here's the, and and you're right. It, it's, it is the best audition story in my career, bar yep. none, period. So um, 
we'll roll back and just talk about Matt for a second. So Matt had done a TV. <laughs> love uh, that. Let's talk about Matt because he will totally love sure, that. Of course. <laughs> so so um, back in the day in the 70s, they did these very special after school specials where, you know, you, the, this kid would be going through a horrible thing and you're supposed to learn about it, you know. So my brother did one called Papa and me about this Italian kid and his, his grandfather and how they loved each other. And so it was this after school special. And Michael saw the special and fell in love with my brother and said, this is a, the cutest kid I've ever seen. I'm going to, I want him to play me as a young man. And so he was amazing. Cause he did what he was in what woman under the influence and stuff. He was in yeah, like a bunch yeah, of, he was and, in, that, he was in, and that, what was that movie? Oh God, circle of children where everybody, like everyone uh -huh. we know was in it. Like, like all of our yeah. friends who were ever child that were all yeah, in the Todd Bridges, myself, Kyle uh, Richards, um, it was a convention of everybody with their child. Katie actors, Kurtzman then, was also in that Kurtzman. thing. It was just, yeah, so everybody. He, he did all of those like dramatic wounded child films of that. Absolutely. Like, year. And so, yeah. So Michael was like, oh my God. So, so Michael yeah, yeah. wrote him in an episode or wrote in an episode where it goes back to how Pa, uh, it was about Pa running away and becoming a man because Pa was okay. going back to meet his father. And so he was, Matthew played Charles in flashback. And then that went well. So he wrote another episode where they wrote an episode where Paul meets Ma. And so they did well, that. That was episode. adorable. And it's Katie Kurtzman yeah. again, isn't it? As yep. Ma. It's like, Ooh. Katie Kurtzman <laughs> as, as Ma. And so I don't remember the exact years, but that was the episode with um, the last episode my brother did was the year before I auditioned. So we'd had experiences with Little House, but I'd never been to the set. I was a big fan of the show. And this is how this week broke down, okay? Monday, the episode, uh, The Race, aired. And so oh, I watched yes. The Race, of, right? Buddy in the Race. One of my favorites, of course. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was a great episode for you. So I watched The Race. I'm like, oh, my God. And, and again, not that the people that are watching this watched Little House, and if they're old enough, they watched it when it was on. But basically, for those of you who aren't old enough, there's like only three networks and there was only a couple of shows with kids on them. And this was one of the only shows that had kids at all. And there was a lot of them. So it was a big show to watch as a kid. So and I love for child show. actors because there was enough volume that a lot of people got their start. I mean, look, Jason yeah. Bateman got a start on Little House in the Prairie. I mean, it was that right. kind of show. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, so I watched it on a Monday, Thursday morning, I get a call that, from my agent saying, hey, they want you to come to Paramount and read for a part on Little House on the Prairie after school. So I go, okay. So my mom drives me down to Paramount. I auditioned for Susie Sukman. And they say, okay, hold on a second. We want you to read for Michael. So can you, can you wait for a second? And we're like, yeah, of course. They go, okay, let's go read for Michael. And they put us in a car. And they didn't really tell us what they were doing. And then they <laughs> drove us to Simi Valley. They kidnap no. you. Wait, so you, wait, this is not normal stuff. Do you go to an audition? Right. Maybe, maybe at an audition, they say, if you have time, can you wait? We'd like to go ahead and have you read for producer and they're here. Okay. Right. They kidnap you and take yes. you. It's like an hour. It's like out the 118. Yeah. Oh, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not down the road. No, it's yeah. really it's, far. It's like, and it's, and you have to go to Santa Susana Pass where like the Manson right. family lived. It's like scary to go to see me. <laughs> It was, it was like going back in time because they, you know, they have a freeway there now, but they were building the freeway. You couldn't get on the freeway and go all the way there. Yeah, so the, we, the we drive out there. Six lanes to nowhere. You get to Simi Valley, which is Big Sky Ranch, and you park with all the other cars and you think you're there. And then they put you in another van. And then that van takes about 20 minutes to go up into the mountains to finally get to where the shooting is happening and so they finally get us to all of the the trailers and everything and i'm like oh okay we're here looks like nothing it's just a bunch of hills and dirt and it's hot as heck and so i'm like okay when are we going to read and i guess we're reading for michael and we walk down that hill behind the um uh the the wood the the, the wheel the oh, water the mill. Wheel, when the, you go down the mill, the yeah, the mill. And, yeah, and yeah when we walk down the like mill <clears throat> exactly so suddenly all of all of a sudden there's walnut grove first time i've seen it and i'm like holy man this is amazing and then there's the big tree in the middle of walnut grove and there's michael landon looking just like michael landon <laughs> there wasn't a moment that he never looked like michael landon right he right. always looked like pa with his big boots his shirt was half open you know he was sunning and he was just hair, hysterical hair, and so just, much hair. No, yeah, perfect so 
I guess there's about five of us. I go and I read. And then, you know, they, they bring one kid forward, they bring the other kid forward, then they bring me forward, and then they bring another kid. And so we're basically just hanging out by the mill. And then he gathers everybody by the tree and he goes, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I know it was a long trip. Thanks for it. But, you know, we're, we're needing to do this quickly. So thank you all very much. Have a nice night. We'll let you know as soon as we know. And so everyone starts no. walking away and Michael grabs my shoulder and he goes, you stay here. <gasps> I'm like, oh. Because okay, totally I'm, because I'm not the brightest guy in the world. I'm like, hmm, this sounds good. Right? It's like, of course it is. It never happens. They do audition. And the fact that they dragged a bunch of people out to location is completely un abnormal. And then, okay, yeah. everybody go home now. Right. No wait. Right. And physically so, like grabs you. It's like. Right. So I've watched, I've watched the race on Monday. I got the call for an audition that morning after school. I auditioned. Then I met Michael Landon in an audition, and now everyone's walking away, and he looks at me, and he goes, you got the part, kid. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And by that time, my brother had been driven over from home by my dad to meet us so that we could have a ride home. And, you know, Michael and Matthew reconnect, and everyone's happy, and they go, go off to wardrobe. So I went off to wardrobe, and I worked the next morning. The very next morning was my first day of work. So as you know, as an actor, you're never, you know, it's like, it can be weeks. It can be months. It's a mystery. You're dying of anticipation. What's going to happen? The morning I got the audition, the afternoon I auditioned for it. The next morning I'm working with Melissa Gilbert, half pint, the star of the show. And we're in a barn running from wolves. And it's like, I, and I, I I I put it up on Twitter. It's like I was like the super fan of ever. I was just asking her every single question. Like I was half the time I'm acting with her, the other half of the time I'm like a you know like a fan. And she was great. And when I met you, you were great. You were like just not <laughs> you. Nothing stopped you. <laughs> it would be like you were in the middle of a conversation. I think I said this about you were. It's like walking into the middle of a conversation with you, and that's how we met. And you told me, you were telling me all about pink flamingos. Um, yes, yes, I'm sorry. And of course, you know, really Melissa did. and the younger kids are like, yeah, they wanted, all the kids said, you need to take us, we'll have a slumber party and you'll take us to the New Art Theater at midnight to see um, Charlotte in Eraserhead or go see pink flamingos. And I'm like, no, no, that's <laughs> never, no, I'm right. not doing that. You're out of your little lines. Um, but yeah, it was and I remember you were just so sweet and innocent. It was like, yeah. And then like suddenly Matt is Albert. They go, we got to town. And, the thing yeah, and then basically after that, so that was the, the one final part of this whole story is, so I'm working on the set and it was like lunch that day that I found out that Andy Garvey was going to be coming back. I, I thought this was for an episode. You were like there for the episode. Yeah. And then one thing I wanted to ask you, which I've heard, but I never knew. I heard later that there was another person had been cast as Andy and that it was a recast and that's why it happened so fast do you know anything about that I don't it's entirely possible because they would do okay. that but also Michael did do stuff like that things were really like you know you hear nowadays about people having to go for network approval and the suits yeah that yeah. did happen occasionally a little house and I think in later years I think like Stan Ivar and Pamela Lance had to go but okay. early on Michael well, A, he was given some leeway, and then he would take leeway. It's like, wait, they don't have network approval. Too late, I hired them. Um, he would just do stuff. Um, when I read, and I don't know how many girls were there for Nelly, and I read, and they went bananas. And now Paramount, which is close to West Hollywood, we got in the car and went from Paramount to our place on, you know, in West Hollywood, like 28 minutes or something. And right. The phone had already rung, and my dad's partner, Jess, was on the phone. It was my agent calling. So we basically, the door shut behind wow. me, and they called my agent. And That's so great. by the time we got in the door, it was, your wardrobe fitting is Tuesday. You're hired. It's done. They'd already had a conversation. My agent had already cut a deal, and I was I had wardrobe wow. like a couple days later. And then within days, I was on the set. I mean, the speed with which it happened, was it was like yeah. that. Because yeah, he didn't it, care. Because people say, "Well, do we need to have her come in and do it?" And no, no, no. We're we're done. I've decided that, the, and that it been it. Also, because the Garvey thing was remember because it was all about the Edwards, 
Right. And then Victor French went to do Carter Country. And uh-huh. then Sophie and Michael were kind of had a falling out because he went, why, why are you leaving me for Carter Country? So it's like, wait, I have to have another family. And then they wanted Merlin Olson, the football player on the show, because we'll get all the guys who watch the football. We'll maybe flip over. Sure. Case. And so this was all happening at lightning speed that they had to do something because Victor was gone. So he may have just said, well, chop, chop, get me another family. Can you get these boys <laughs> over here? It was like that. Give me a fresh family. Yeah. yeah, it just says, order me up a family. So he would do that. And yeah, Michael wouldn't think it was weird. It's like, well, have them come read for me, but you're in see me. We'll bring them over here. <laughs> that would yeah, like, and, oh, and really? look, I, I, I was on his side because unlike a lot of TV people, the guy was directing, writing, and producing the show. And like, and when I say writing, you know it, but other people may not. He's writing it on a, on a legal pad in a car on the way to work. Okay, and you so it's like the guy too. didn't I caught, I caught stop him in the working. Dressing room with the legal pad and the pencil, and I was like, "They're yeah. writing this now. Oh, are we shooting that in a week?" Right. Yeah. yeah. No, the guy was supremely talented. He obviously, with his history with Bonanza, there was a weird moment when, uh, speaking of Jag and Little House, when Jag started shooting, we start we first four years were shot at Paramount, mm-hmm. and where remember where Sleepy or Mankato. The big western town that was from oh, Bonanza, Winoka. Winoka, Winoka, right, Winoka. with the hotel, right. and that was because we were shooting at. We shot all in Little House of right. Paramount, so we moved to MGM. But Winoka was on Paramount; it wasn't in Sydney. Right. That was on Paramount. Yeah, it was on Paramount. And when we shot Jag, by the time we'd shot Jag, they'd torn down the western town. Oh, and it was a parking lot. It was literally, you know, tore down Paradise to build a parking lot. That's so right, they tore down the, the western town. Paramount. That's where the Winoka Hotel was. Oh my God, it's all yeah. And so it's a parking lot, but it's also the the beginning of their big water tank. So on one of the episodes of Jag with, um, oh gosh, oh, who's the, D. Wallace Stone was playing a senator. And in one of these big episodes, she meets us on this ship and they built this big battleship in the parking lot at Paramount. And I just remember going, wow, what kind of life is it? <laughs> Where as a kid I played here in the 1870s, and now I'm landing on a on a battleship in the middle of you know Hollywood at the same physical location. It so was, yeah, it was B, crazy. The B tank at Paramount's a trip. You can sort of see it still when you go by because it's weird because it has that yeah. big wall that's like the side of right. what is that? It's blue like a sky and this sloped lot which they throw parties in, put in some tables, have an event, right. use it as part. But they fill it up with water, so it's like what three feet deep at the deepest point or something. Uh-huh. But all yeah. those underwater shots or battleships and things. I think right. like when Laura's toe got bit by a crab, that was like in the B tank. So we were that the tank. The B tank was used for everything. Yep. Everything. So yeah, bizarre. It was, it was pretty. Uh, it was an amazing uh, uh, a place to be for for us kids, for sure. Did you spend I so mean, much time at Paramount? How many of the eight bazillion shows that you've done were at Paramount? Did you like live in Paramount practically? Pretty much, yeah. It was. We we did. Of course, we did a Little House there, and then uh, we shot the first three years of Jag there, and then they moved us out to uh, Valencia, where we had our own stages but and then after that uh, when my wife and i created see dad run which was a sitcom for nick uh, nickelodeon we shot on the stage 19 where uh, the oh, show yeah. starred scott Bayo. so they gave us the stage where he shot happy days so yeah three different shows have have shot on the paramount lot at three different times and up until the first year of our show of see dad run Remember um, A.C. Lyles from Paramount, the old cowboy dude who dressed like in spats and he was impeccably dressed. Oh my God, yes. He was like, yeah, he was like the mayor of Paramount and he had been there (laughs) since literally the 30s. So yeah, so he had been there through all of these periods of time and we got to, you know, anyways. But yeah, it was, it's, it's a real, it's a real homecoming type of place. And also, you know, if you've been around or even if you've been on the tours of the different Hollywood studios, Paramount has the singular best view of any lot ever, which is, and it stands in front of stage 19. You stand in front of stage 19 and you look down the street and above the stages, you can see the Hollywood sign. 
It's true because it's the only ones there. Because people don't really think, oh, it's Hollywood Studios. They're all in the valley. They're all out yeah. in the valley. It's easy. They see the Hollywood yeah. side, but Paramount's in Hollywood, and it's like there. Right. It's right there. I love. I love. It's also tiny when you think about the size of Studios. Yeah. Paramount's actually really small, and they jammed all that stuff in there. Now, so it little. Actually, two it studios. It was National, right. uh, National, and RKO, and so RKO was that other half by Gower. And it was Desi Lu and the uh -huh. sound stages that Lucy said, "Yes, we're going to make Star Trek." And Star Trek was on. I think they were nine and ten. Those became the sound stages for Little House, like thirty and thirty-one. So yes, we're wow. actually the same sound stages. So it's completely nuts. Well, and, so, and yeah. when 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 Tina and I got our offices for C Dad Run, they later told us because it would have exploded my head that we were actually in the physical offices that the ones that we had in the building were Gene Roddenberry's personal office. I would have had a heart attack. Yes. It did, yeah. but yeah, we did, we're like, it's so weird. We feel old now. We're like Hollywood history. So you, you <laughs> wind up the house, but then your brother Matt is there. Like said, everyone's related. So what was it like to be on a show? Like I said, everyone's related to where you're literally your whole family's there because your mom and dad did come to the set and your mom was right. there like all the, okay. Your mom, Frankie, and like for the show, I said, Can we talk about Frankie? We love Frankie was so amazing. Everybody loved Frankie. Frankie was hilarious and an incredible yeah. person and, and your dad run, but everybody was like Frankie. Oh my God. If you met Frankie Laverta, every just, just Frankie was it. Um, so they were very cool. So they're there all the time. And then Matt's there cause he's Albert and then right. you're Andy. So you did your whole family like hanging out on this set with it how what was this like well you i mean obviously what's the weird part about it is is that if it was any other set it might have been weird but melissa and jonathan were there robin and rachel were there you know all of the people that all the kids were related to the crew it didn't feel different except it was the only show like that History. Like if you, you know, so that. you know, like what you said earlier, you know, you were the only one there that didn't have a sibling on the show, basically, and so it was kind of uh, that was the that was the norm, um, and that part of it was really great. I mean, I always not that we're them, no, <laughs> we are not the Beatles, but the Beatles, you know, <laughs> they they have one quote that says, you know, there's only three other guys that know what it's like to be a Beatle. You know, and that's true. It's like you, you, they went through it together. So my brother and I, you and Melissa, and Melissa and Jonathan, all the all the kids that were on the show, they're the only ones that really know what it was like to be on Little House on the Prairie like that. And it, it is. And so, I mean, we're not the Beatles, but close sometimes because I always said Little House has taken on a weird, weird life of its own. As you've now, because you're you're now killing it on Twitter. If everyone does not know, he is on Twitter and is absolutely <laughs> freaking hilarious and posting like the like you're getting photos taken down because it looks like blood. Um hilarious stuff. But <laughs> a lot of shows that were even enormous hits at the same time in the late 70s, like family, it was won all the Emmys. Mm -hmm. all the, they're not out on DVD and Blu-ray. They're not being rerun constantly on right. five different cable channels. They're not streaming on Amazon. And people are not dressing up as them, like for Halloween and for Weird West. They're not flying across the country to South Dakota to like run around in bonnets. Um, we have this weird place that we occupy that many very popular shows of the time, people are like, oh, yeah, I sort of remember that. Whereas people are watching Little House like right now. We have like new fans tuning in and people are dressing up. I said, no, this is sort of like being on Star Trek or in The Wizard of Oz because you're in this weird thing that just keeps coming back at the holidays and people dress up. It's its, its own you, weird you know why? thing. Why? Why? I'm frightened. Why? No, this was this was really interesting. I remember I was sitting at lunch and again, I just want to share this with people because it's hard to understand. Michael ate lunch with us when he ate lunch. He really didn't <laughs> eat because he was doing a thousand different things. But when he ate lunch, he would sit down and eat with us. He wasn't like, you know, a big movie star that disappears into his trailer. He and Merlin shared a honey wagon. It was like you couldn't oh, yeah. fit both of them in, in a honey wagon at the same time, yet it, basically he was showing you good etiquette or good set etiquette. Anyway, so he was sitting down eating one day and, and I was sitting with him and he was always approachable and we were talking and Mork and Mindy had just premiered and it was getting huge ratings and, and, and they shot it at Paramount. Exactly. And so we would see, yeah, we would see Robin on, on the set and he was really kind to all the kids and he would entertain us and, you know, run off to the set. And so I was telling Michael how funny Robin Williams was and, oh my God, it's going to be such a huge show. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing. And he goes, yeah, that's great. He's talented, but you know, no one's going to remember it. And I go, what are you talking about? And he goes, look, 
this show is going to be remembered in 30, 40, 50 years. Mork and Mindy's never going to be remembered. I go, you're crazy, Michael Landon. You don't know anything about TV, basically. It's kind of what I said. And he goes, no, I know it is because we're dressed in the 1870s. We're not dating ourselves. There's nothing here to date us because we're already dated. The, the idea that we're in the 1870s, we don't have, and he said this with, you know, a, a straight face. He goes, you know, we don't have current haircuts and crazy things like that. And it's like, dude, you like set the tone for the 70s haircut. But let's let's pass that by. A lot but of basically what he was saying was the true. Boys with the 70s hair. We did have a lot of boys with 70s hair. But no, it was right. true. Because like people say, oh, yeah, I remember Melissa once going, yeah, are we ready to be nostalgic? Yeah, it's like, dude, we we're nostalgic when we started. It was the 1800s. What, you know, what do you do? It, <laughs> it doesn't date. And we uh, Little House ran in countries that didn't want to always run American shows because well, it was wholesome. It was right. the 1800s were all covered. And it was weird. And it does. It doesn't date. It's, well, the Brady Bunch. The Brady Bunch, they're in the height of like 19. 70s, 71 fashion. It's like, nope, 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 nope. We were just in our own. Well, and I mean, world. and look at what, I mean, since there was such great love for the Brady Bunch, when they remade the, the series into a movies, which were great, what did they do? They played on the kitschiness of the 70s because that's what, it was so unique and so specific. And, you know, it's just, they, I, had, I had a similar conversation yeah. with uh, Donald Belisario, the guy that created JAG, where, you know, I, I, I told him the story about what I just told you. And he goes, I understand it because that's what's happening. That's going to happen with Jag because everyone's in military outfits. You know, the same one that John Wayne wore in the forties, you're wearing the same out uniform. It's all uniforms. And so it's not, it's, it's, you know, it's a very similar situation with Jag as well with the, with the DVDs and the fact that there's always going to be people in the service and the stories of people in the service are always going to be, you know, stories about people. Yeah, Jag's not going away. And and that was something. Michael, Michael also tapped in. I remember Melissa even told the story that two of them walk, it was like near the end of the show and they're walking around, the whole thing's ending. And he says, People are going to be watching these shows long after I'm dead and gone, long after we're all gone. They're going to be watching these shows and talking about this after we're all gone. And Melissa said at the time she thought he was absolutely out of his mind. Because remember, there was no cable TV, there were no DVDs, there was nothing. She's like, How right. will they be watching this? What are you talking talking about and he was like they will be watching the show after i'm gone and we're like ha, 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 let's humor the crazy and here we all are so yeah he knew yeah. what he was doing, absolutely knew what he was doing um which is an amazing thing for all of us kids to have grown up with because many kids are on shows where you don't have a mad genius walking around like that and we got right. to like witness this stuff which was incredible well and remember too which i only could appreciate after i understood that he had been on bonanza for 15 to 20 years so yeah, like, he had already had, yeah. yeah I mean, he, he, if you if you measure success by <laughs> by, I mean, he had already been a huge successful star long before Little House was ever thought of, and so he had learned all of that stuff prior, I think, and that's one of the reasons why I think he he picked Little House over, you know, a thousand other scripts he could have done. Yeah. Oh yeah, because he was offered everything. He's like, no, I want to do this. He, no, he knew. Now, okay, I'm looking at. The 10,000 pages of your filmography resume. I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, I didn't even know he said. Now, wait, you you actually got to be in Blazing Saddles? Because Blazing Saddles, yeah. start, it was 74 when Little House started. And it was hilarious because it was like the greatest Western parody ever in the history of Earth. And pretty much everyone who was on Little House had memorized it at some point. Catherine was a big yeah. you know, Mel Brooks fan. And so here we were doing this Western. And we did. We used to quote it and like scream with laughter and go, oh, my God, it's like Blazing Saddles. Um, you were actually in Blazing Saddles. Who the heck did you play in Blazing Saddles? This is one of my, I mean, as, as I, I'm so excited that I had the experience. However, you know, I think the runtime of that movie is like 92 minutes. And so I got cut out, but what they did was, is that I had three substantial bits that they were real things that we really shot and that I was there for a month and a half on the, at, at that, uh, for that movie, it was at the Warner brothers, um, Western lot. And I played a kid in rock Ridge. And so there were three scenes. One was when the, the bad guys came through town and were beating everybody up. They came over and they took my pet snake and they tied it in a knot. And I look at him and I go, what have they done to you, pal? And they then they go off. and like genius. They cut that. That would have been great. They, they cut that. And then when they're in the church looking for a new sheriff, right? They're like going, well, we're going to need a new sheriff. I raise my hand and I'm like about what, nine? 
And I go, I, I, I'll be sheriff. I want to be sheriff. And everyone's like, well, look at him. He's brave. He's big for his age. Let the kid be sheriff. And so they're all talking about letting him be sheriff. And now I'm seeing on my computer that my battery's about to die. Let me just plug in. I'm sorry. Live, live on the on the TV broadcasting. Um, <laughs> As he plugs himself in, let's see, we've had Suri refuse a command. Now we have to plug in the computer. Technology is not our friend. There we are. I like, I like when you told Suri to do, and Suri was like, no. No, she just, she's sassy. <laughs> so, you know, let him be sheriff. Let the little kid be sheriff. And then my mother, you know, takes him away, takes me away and says, you can't be sheriff. And then they go back to the scene where he goes, well, we're going to need somebody. And then the final scene was when uh, Cleavon Little shows up and he does the big walk through town that first day. And, you know, the little lady goes up yours and he comes across a bunch of kids beating up a little kid and the little kid's me and he gets everyone away and he goes, hey, 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 what's going on here? And I go, nothing, Sheriff, we're just playing. And he goes, what kind of game are you playing? And I go, we're playing Welcome the New Sheriff. And, you know, a great big line. So. It was a great time. Um, Mel Brooks, every time I did a scene, would run up and down the uh, the set screaming, he's going to be a star, he's going to be a star, he's going to be a huge effing star. And at the time, I'm a little kid, I'm thinking the director likes me, not realizing what a hysterical bit, <laughs> you know, he's doing, which he was, he was wonderful. But I loved, loved that scene. The one scene when he, when the sheriff walks into town and he walks up right before he takes himself hostage, there's a little kid that's down below. That's the only thing that's left. And that's me. Okay. I am shocked that it was cut because what you're describing is freaking hilarious, but yeah, the movie was long. So what are they going to do? But um, I, I I, like jealous because I'm like, oh yeah, Blazing Saddles. Love it. Love it. Love it. Was thrilled to see the Trina. Um, So much you do like so much. I mean, it's just like the number of things you have done is just completely crazy. The whole summer school ski school thing. So like you were in summer school and then it like all, almost the, all started, the schools during the eighties, yeah. like a franchise <laughs> and just turned into this thing. And um, you became famous for playing idiots at one point. Now, Andy Garvey was yep. a lovely, smart, nice, very innocent, a naive little boy, as I manipulated you ruthlessly, as we know in that episode. Um, and, and you're a good old normal kid, you know, Jag, a really good guy, but you did have a phase, uh, you know, Heather's and, and summer school, uh-huh. where you played these jock, moron, beefy, yeah. just thick-headed goons. I loved it. I mean, it Which was so much to. fun. That's like so not you. What, how did you do? Well, it, I, you get probably the biggest, the biggest audition character I did uh, was, was either Heather's and Three Ninjas was like the biggest characters that I did. But yeah, it, there was a period where there was just, it was the 80s. And so you either were in horror movies, which I did one, or you did these, you know, sex comedies, and I did one of those. And then you did these other movies. The one that was really special for me, you know, Summer School became a big hit, and it was a really good movie. But the one that I couldn't get over that I was in was Heather's. Um, I was a fan of that script. And just, I couldn't believe that I was in it. And so I, you know, I went all out with the audition playing the dumbest guy I could play. And sure enough, I got it. And it was just, it was, it was, it was great. It was great. Now the summer, summer school started first and then it was you who really kind of propelled into the, into the, the multiple school movies. How did that all work out? Because like we had summer school, suddenly there's ski school and this. Yeah, basically we did summer school and another actor, I think you know, uh, Dean Cameron, and I know you know Richard, Richard Horvitz, and we had done summer school. And then these people in out of Canada, it's always out of Canada, as your dad would tell you, um, that they wanted to do a, a ski school movie. And they'd said, well, let's just hire the people from summer school that had the, the, the word school in it. So they hired us and we went up there. And it was really cold um, because it was, it was ski school. It was, in, it was, you know, we were skiing. And I made a joke to the director. I said, why don't we just move this down to the Bahamas and call it scuba school? And he goes, well, write me a script. And so I wrote a script. And that ended up being another movie called National Lampoon's Last Resort, which ended up starring Corey Feldman and Corey Haim. But that was supposed to be another 
like another school movie. But yeah, it just sort of was like a, a, a you know, at that period of time when they did those types of movies, which, man, you can't, I can't imagine them doing them now. They were so, some of them were really cheesy. Some of them were really fun. I remember I called that period of the eighties. I, I did not, I did Fantasy Island, Love Boat and stuff. I didn't uh-huh. do those films because um, as I said, it was a time period where if you were a blonde, blue eyed girl, like I was, you had to be either a cheerleader, naked or dead yeah. or a combination right. of the three. And yeah, I, yeah. I auditioned for some of these things and it was just like, no. <laughs> And I, I, I no, totally yeah. get that. I mean, it was absolutely that way. In fact, I was just pulling some clips together for a project I'm working on. And I'm like looking at this going, how, how did they get away with this? And I guess it was just the times. But again, you know, I, I would, I would say that you made the right call. Definitely. <laughs> and some of them, it was like, I look like the bimbo and then I'd open my mouth and they go, no, 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 don't leave, just leave. Um, your fabulous name, uh, Laberto, it is French originally, yes? Ah, uh, well, or maybe. Do we know? Because Paris, people in Paris, they look at me like, what are you trying to do with this fake French name? <laughs> it was apparently, um, apparently it's some sort of Cajun variant. Ah, uh, that and makes so, sense, because it's not, it's not really spelled really French, but it makes sense, yes. It's a very, very Louisiana kind of thing yeah exactly yeah. it's like alligators and gumbo and some beer and they came up with laberto so yeah and, and then of course point, i'm adopted so i'm not even french so oh, right so then a, but now at one point you and your brother for some bizarre you spelled your names differently did you go <laughs> i i am so confused was it spelled one way once and then you both spelled it differently and then if you've gone back to spelling it the same i am completely confused because i remember one day people said you know they spelled their names differently and i went i have no idea what's going on why what, what it's hard enough to spell as it is but that's like changing it up so when you're welcome to hollywood back in the day there was dorothy day otis agency which was like the big oh, commercial agent God, you remember so- Yes, yes. She had all the children, all the children. Right. She had all the kids. And then we also had another agent called Iris Burton, who was also the like, oh, God, she was like the Mack truck of kids agents. It's like you just didn't want to mess with Iris Burton or Dorothy uh, Dorothy Day Otis. And so we were lucky enough to get these agents. But Dorothy Day Otis said, this last name of yours is very confusing and hard (laughs) to say. So we're going to change your name. And we said, okay. And they go, we're going to take the Y out of your name. And it's like taking a Z out of Schwarzenegger. It's like why, just one letter. It doesn't really so, help. Maybe you could change the whole thing. Like you said, we're going to call you the the Lance brothers. I mean, but yeah, so, exactly. But no, letter. yeah, L A B Y O R T E A U X then became L A B O R T E A U X. Would and you so know it was, something about the T E A U X? I think that would right. be the part that would concern me if I was going to change. So they changed it when we first started and then all the way up through Little House. And then after Little House, I said, look, this is kind of crazy. I hate to like, because then it becomes really confusing because your taxes are with one letter and the other one is your contracts are with another. And so I said, I just want to go back to having my name be my name. And I don't know. I don't remember the details. I don't know if Matthew did that until later. I know he does now. But there was a time where we both had "quote unquote" separate names, but that's why. That t- t- totally bonkers. But yeah, Hollywood is all about changing people's names, literally even the spelling. Um, it was a very weird. And if you were, especially the kids' yeah. agents, were like, "Let's try to make it." There was also a move then, even as late as the seventies. Does your name sound ethnic? I mean, it was like, that was like a thing well, too. It's like, if your name is Archibald <laughs> Leach, I get maybe changing it to the Cary Grant, but you know. It would be like changing Archibald Leach to Archibald Lech. Yeah, it's like, right. Why are you doing that? Completely what it is. All right. Of the 10,000 things you've done, I'm flipping through because I'm like, I didn't even see half this crap you were in. Oh, my God. What did you not do? What's your favorite <laughs> thing? Is it is it See Dad Run? Is it the stuff you've produced and, and written? Is it the oh. stuff you've been in? What, do you, what would you say? Do you have a favorite? Probably overall, See Dad Run probably was was the favorite mainly because my wife and I, Tina came up with the idea. It was based on my experience on uh, JAG where the basic idea was, uh, uh, you know, the um, America's number one dad is on a TV show for 10 years and he comes home 
and he's got three kids of his own that he's now got to raise in real life, but he raises them like he would on TV using old scripts and episodes as his, you know, touchstone. His wife is an actress who has been in a coma on her soap opera for 10 years. And so now she's going off to work. So it's like, it's a sitcom and, you know, hilarity ensues. But we took all of the stories that we could from our own lives. So the lead character basically were, was stories from our, from our own life. And in fact, one of the coolest things is if you ever get a chance to see it, it's called See Dan Run. It was on Nick at Night. You can rent episodes. The very beginning starts off on a family watching TV and the, zooms into the TV where you see the lead character walking away from his TV show and walking home. Nice. The family that's watching the TV is myself, my son, and my wife, Tina. We nice. open the show as ourselves. It's really kind of magical. And then just the experience of working with my wife, Tina, and having it be you know something that we did together having the name of the son be the same name as our son, having, you know, like an issue that happened at his little league happen on the show. It was just, uh, it was really, really cool. That sounds and very Michael that Landon. That's very Michael Landon of you. Um, well, yeah. And, it, and don't think that there's not, I remember watching Michael write and direct on the set thinking, I want to do that. And I can't believe that I actually got to do it. And then I'm thinking about it the other day, I had called Linwood Boomer, because he had run Malcolm in the middle. And I said, yeah. we're going to run this show. How do you do it? And we were having this conversation and I'm yeah. like going, what are the odds that like from a TV show in the seventies, that two other shows creators are, are like actors on that. Yeah. For those who didn't guess, I'm Gordon sure it was because Floyd of Adam Michael. Became the guy who created Malcolm in the middle. Hello. Um, yeah. Right. So it's huge, 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 huge. Now, now you have, you have a whole acting school workshop thing, private right. group classes now online. Now, of course, I have to, didn't you have a pretend how to workshop <laughs> at one time on the internet? It was the funniest thing ever. He had a thing, he created a sort of a fake how to be an actor piece by a yeah. character that was like the world's worst ex-child star screw up in the history of earth this character just dumb as a box of rocks explaining like how to go on an audition i watched those things you did i screamed i screamed my head uh, I'm off so, you're, so funny. you were the only one and i'm, I'm and, and it was worth it if just if you just were laughing at it because to me it was it was called acting good, acting <laughs> good. and the guy's name was c timmy blake <laughs> Let's and see. you know, he was so dumb. He, he was, so dumb. He was, it was a lovely. star of a TV show in the seventies called that's nuts. And now he's, he wants to be, you know, he, it, the, the main, the huge main difference was uh, between he and I was that um, he didn't have a, a successful acting career after that's nuts. He did and not. so it was just, but it was, yeah. Dumb as a box full of rocks was a, was a great description. And don't think that when I started this acting school, I wasn't aware of the fact that I had just, that I'm doing the thing that I had parodied. And so, so you the, the thought that went real, into it. So a, a, a former child star has an acting school, uh, but it is right. acting school, school uh, acting good for people who want to act it. It actually is a <laughs> legitimate acting school where you actually um, teach people useful and real things. Where where do we yeah. get hold of that? If people want to come the and see real, the not stupid guy. The where real they... school is called workingactorsschool.com. And the basic yeah. idea is, you know, I'm a working actor and what we talk about and what I teach and what the whole push of the school is about is the difference between being in an actor studio where you're protected and you're exploring characters and you're being vulnerable and you're doing all of the things that one has to do to create characters and to be a better actor. That's separate. That's respected and it's understood. Working actor school is about, okay, now you're on set. The lighting guy says they have 20 minutes to get the shot you have to be in your character and give the performance and know your dialogue and hit the you know the the blocking and deal with the person that you're working with on a set and you've got to have all the practical knowledge of how to do that and then of course with um you know the covid and everything where everything started happening online it occurred to me that you know there's so many people out there that want to have maybe their kids get into acting or they're a child and they want to find out how to act. And I've had that experience as have you. And I've had the experience of 
working as an adult actor. And then with um, See Dad Run, I had the opportunity to be a producer and I ran casting direct uh, uh, casting yep. sessions. And I got to tell you, the biggest acting lesson I ever learned was being a producer. Uh, and, I, and this one, this one I'm giving away for free. Here's, here's the big secret. <laughs> As a producer, when an actor would walk in, people that I knew, people that I asked to have come in and read, they would read and there would just be something clicking in me going, no, they're not right. And it had nothing to do with their performance. They could be great. They could have been wonderful, but it's just, you're either right for the part or you're not. And when I realized that as an actor on the actor side of it, so much was taken off of, you know, there's so much grief that goes into acting wanting, oh, if I'd only done this one little thing, it would have changed everything. No, it doesn't. And so working actor school is, is based around the idea that you're, you're going to be working on a set. I'm going to be giving you all the information you need to know about how all of it goes down. We have, uh, you know, basic, intermediate, advanced. We have workshops. Nice. There's also private tutoring as well. You know, a one-on-one -on -one private if you're working on a particular part or if you're going up for an audition. And kind of like the, uh, the catchphrase is you don't have to be in Hollywood to train in Hollywood. Okay. And, and it's so, working, working actor working actors school.com actors school.com but it's true because yeah. as an actor i mean that's one of the things find it like when you're a child actor you might get hired or not hired because they have to match you to the family and they already cast the parents and yeah. they have dark hair and you need to right. look like them and you don't know that you don't know that to me go oh, i was terrible no you weren't terrible you didn't match part and people don't realize the variables in it that there may be something they're specifically looking for and you, you're just not them but you could have been brilliant that's why sometimes right. you go on auditions and then you get called in for something else and but that's that's a hollywood thing that yeah people don't know they don't know they think it's just all about them and it's not um horrifyingly we have to wrap this up i am gonna have to have you like back on because we could do this for like five hours easily um fun. fine i will do fun quickly now know where to find you so okay working school.com yes 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 go 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 he's yes. brilliant he's not the dumb guy um he is the smart guy and <laughs> um but fun. okay so the episode the cheaters yes how People weird love was that, that? Episode. I'm like haranguing you because you were so good. You were like total perfect straight man. You were like, I, I, I don't know. Uh, 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 and like in terror <laughs> as I'm just like, and you're going to get me the answers. And you're going to do it. Do you know how I get such good grades? Because you studied. No, I cheat. And it's, I was like in your face. Doing it. Was that like unpleasant, intimidating? Were you trying to not, not burst out laughing? What was that like when I was torturing you? As a child actor, <laughs> there's... <laughs> My brother and I both took great um, pride in the fact that we were like total pros in the sense of that you you weren't supposed to crack a joke. You weren't supposed to, you know, you're supposed to know your dialogue. And especially with Michael and Little House, you wanted to make sure that everything was exactly the way it was supposed to be. So as far as that goes, we always came in prepared and, and I, I wanted to make sure that I was prepared for that. As far as working with you, it was like a, a breeze because so many times you're working with an actor and sometimes on camera when it's all done, their performance looks great. But in the room, what they're giving you and what it feels like doesn't feel like anything. But Why with you, so it felt exactly, it felt like, you know, you were attacking me so it was yeah. real easy and you were nelly for crying out loud i mean i know that you were nice to me off camera but when the cameras went on and you were nelly i'd been watching the show for years so it was terrifying <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you but i just because i remember at the time going it's just like blowing this kid back into the wall i'm like <laughs> um you are wonderful on twitter what is your twitter handle they need to follow you on twitter he underscore Laberto with a with Y, y. Labby yeah. your toe dukes and so he is on Twitter he's very funny he's posting marvelous photos and saying very funny things and oh, working after school.com you are a wonderful person you're so talented and so marvelous and just generally a really nice guy always did like you and um there you are Same thank here. you so much thank you for coming thanks on. for having me on this was really really fun I can't believe well, it went so quick to have you back and this is the Allison Argram show and I'm Allison Argram. I found my way home.